Uh, we can go to your word, and um, we thank you that, God, you have, though some questions might seem complex to us, God, you do not contradict yourself, and you are clear in uh, what you stand for through your word, Lord, and help us to uh, get understanding and help us to learn and grow tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a Bible verse to start us out is Proverbs 18, 15, which says, The heart of the understanding requires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. And so that's what we're, that should be our posture, right? That we have hearts of understanding, and then through that we acquire knowledge. And then also being able to listen and gain knowledge through um, through listening, right? And being becoming wise through that. So uh, that's what we want to do tonight, and that is our aim tonight. And, uh, yeah, anything else, guys? That's good. All right. First question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to guess in the audience who asked these questions. I'm just going <laughs> to look and see. No, <laughs> no I'm not. <laughs> okay, so question number one. Is it true that we can't have one point of tulip without the other to remain consistent? If so, can you explain how? Maybe explain tulip first. Yeah. Because some people might not have an understanding of what that is. For sure. And then we'll go from there. Yeah. So tulip is uh, an acrostic uh, that we have is it, that describes the doctrines of grace or what's also known as Calvinism um, or just the doctrine of salvation. And uh, it's Reformed theology. And uh, tulip is uh, T-U-L-I-P. So it's total depravity, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, uh, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So those are the five kind of uh, 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 pillars of salvation. And uh, so the question is, uh, can we do without one of them? Yeah, so can, yeah, can you have, like, take one of them out and can you still be consistent? Right. Um, the overall answer is, is, is no. I don't believe we can. Uh, usually, you know, people will call themselves four-point Calvinists. And usually the, the one of those points that they take out, it, the most common one is the limited atonement. Uh, and people have difficulty with that uh, because limited atonement essentially teaches that Jesus died only for the elect uh, and atoned for the sins of only the elect, not the entire, not all of, all of humanity, but uh, rather he died specifically for the, the bride, his bride. Uh, that's the doctrine that most people have difficulty with, and so that's usually the first one to go. Uh, is that limited atonement. But what, what uh, ends up happening if you remove uh, that, uh, well, let me say that uh, if you can have limited atonement, then it's essentially, uh, it's called general atonement, not limited atonement, meaning that Christ atoned on the cross for, for just generally for all of humanity. Uh, or universal redemption, it's also called. Um, it's believed that Christ died for all men, um, but that death is applied only to those who believe. Uh, I believe this is inconsistent with the other four points of TULIP, uh, because what it does is it makes total depravity only partial depravity, um, because it's reliant on us for our faith, you know, to, to accomplish, uh, to apply and actualize that redemption, make that general atonement specific for the believer. Uh, and so it makes total depravity partial depravity. Uh, it makes uh, unconditional uh, election, an election that's conditional on our faith. Uh, it it makes uh, irresistible grace something that the sinner that is in hell, uh, it, it basically says that person resisted uh, the, the grace of God or the atonement of Christ, the, the work of salvation. Uh, it was meant for them, but they resisted, and that's why they're not believing. Uh, and then it, it, uh, changes our, it changes the preservation or the perseverance of the saints uh, into something that is not guaranteed 
by Christ's atonement. Because if you think about it, especially that last one, that the preservation or perseverance of the saints, uh, without limited atonement, uh, our salvation is insecure. Because when Christ died on the cross, according to a four-point Calvinist, when Christ died on the cross, he made salvation possible. He didn't secure it. And uh, if, he, if, if salvation is possible, then the unsalvation of someone is possible. It's a hopeful thing. It's not secure. Um, I think one, one section of Scripture that's most helpful to me is in John 10. Uh, let me read that. John 10, a familiar passage, at least the first verse, is... In John 10, verse 11, it says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Right? So we all know that, that, that verse, but uh, specifically when he's talking about laying down his life in the place of his sheep, uh, there, that is particular redemption. That's a limited atonement. I die. The good shepherd, what makes him good is that he dies for his sheep. In the context, he's been talking about other sheep that are not his. And, but he says, I die for my sheep, though. And then, so the question is, who are his sheep? Well, verse 27 and 29. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. Uh, 27 and 29. I, I know them. They follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish ever, and no one will snatch it out of my hand. Uh, my father... Uh, who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Notice the, the Father has given these sheep to the Son, and that is why the Son dies for those sheep. It's particular right from uh, even before Christ comes to the earth. Uh, he comes to fulfill the Father's will. And the Father's will is that his son would die for the people whom he has given to Christ. And would you say we arrive at Tulip via systematic theology or looking at Scripture as a whole and then using the acrostic of Tulip to help us better understand as, as like a teaching tool? Uh, yeah. So Tulip is, well, I would say it's both. So uh, we arrive to tulip, uh, the doctrines of grace, as a result of uh, biblical exposition and systematic theology, but it is a tool that is specific to its time, even. Um, Calvin was writing against false teaching, and so he, would, and, and so he developed these, uh, these, these doctrines of grace in response to uh, Arminianism. Uh, and the belief that, you know, Jesus died for everybody and that, uh, you know, people have a spark of life in them and they just need a little bit of help or maybe a lot of help, but just help from God. He was writing against that. And so it's, Tulip is actually uh, specific to its time. Um, and so it's not, it doesn't cover every aspect of all of salvation. It doesn't talk about adoption. Uh, it doesn't talk about other things like that. But, uh, when it comes to uh, God's sovereignty over salvation, that's really what TULIP is about. Uh, I would say, yeah, uh, the best way to understand TULIP is put an S at the beginning of it. Uh, Sproul said, you know, it should start with sovereignty of God. Stulip for something Stulip. like Stulip, yeah. yeah. So Sproul said, well, I wish we, it would have been Stulip, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, instead of stulip, he, he stuck with tulip. But uh, it really all does come down to the sovereignty of God at every point. All right. Question number two. Can you describe the difference between God's active will and passive will? Hmm. All right. Maybe define each and then the difference maybe? Yes. Um. So active will of God is usually used, it's a term that's used to describe 
uh, what God personally and directly does in this world, right? Uh, this is what he was actively involved in. Passive uh, will of God is usually used to describe what God allows or permits to happen in this world, specifically sin. He allows that to happen. Um, however, active and passive will aren't actually uh, uh, the best way to think about that. Uh, in your conservative systematic theologies uh, that are reliable, they, they don't use those words. Uh, uh, other, you know, theologians do. Uh, but I'll, I'll, let me get to, let me say some before I get to why I think they do that. But uh, the best or right words to use instead of active and passive are the creative will and uh, uh, preceptive will. So decree and precept, right? Decree or command. Uh, those are the two wills of God, uh, doctrinally and biblically speaking. The creative will is his, is his secret will. It's his sovereign will, what he has decided in eternity past, what he has decreed. His preceptive will is also called his revealed will or his desired will. Uh, for example, the, com the Ten Commandments or Jesus' command, you know, love one another, even as I have loved you. Those are the, re this is what God desires for the world, desires for his people. Um, what's difficult is that sometimes, many times, God has decreed uh, that sinners disobey his prescribed will, right? God has decreed in eternity past that there be sinners who, who neglect or disobey his prescribed will in Scripture. Uh, and this, this, this uh, active and passive will thing uh, is, is, is used to try and give more detail to that sovereign will, that hidden will. It's trying to give more detail to what's hidden, which on face value is, is very difficult to give detail to what we don't really know fully. How do we do that, right? Um, usually the intent of you know, saying, well, God actively decreed that all these good things would happen, but all the bad stuff that happens, God was passive in his will, like he just he just kind of let sinners go and sinners will sin, uh, and uh, you know he doesn't really have anything to do with that. And theologians have formulated this passive will to exonerate or excuse God or to keep God's hands clean from the evil that we see in this world. Um, but the reality is that God doesn't need our help to do that. Um, he 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 is sovereign, and man is responsible. Those are two sure, definite things in Scripture. Uh, so he has decreed both good and evil uh, actively, I would say. He, he actively, purposefully decreed every act, every, there's no, uh, uh, there's no molecule that escapes the sovereignty of God. Yeah, I was going to say, to, to be truly sovereign, he has to, right? He has to. He can't just, you know, have control over this, but, but allow sinners to do their sin thing over here, and hopefully that works out um, for God's purposes. Uh, that's, that's the idea of passive will. Um, I'm, I'm describing it with a broad brush, but that's, at its essence, that's what it is. It seeks to exonerate God of any fault. But, I mean, in Acts 2, 22 to 24, uh, Peter says that uh, Christ died and was put to death by the hands of godless men by the predetermined knowledge and plan of God. He couldn't have said it more explicitly. Predetermined knowledge and plan or purpose of God. God purposed for them to kill his son. He planned out every detail of them killing his son. Uh, he purposed, he had a purpose in it. And he knew exactly what was going to happen because he decided what would happen beforehand. 
And so God was not passive in that. <laughs> you know, he was, he was uh, very active in the planning and the orchestrating of the murder of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't need to be kept safe from blame. That's, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> all right. Question three. In John 1, 31, the Bible says that Jesus did not know, or sorry, let me read that again. Let me start again. In John 1, 31, the Bible says that John did not know that Jesus was the Messiah. Can you explain how John did not know Jesus was the Messiah when John not only leaped in Elizabeth's womb when Mary came to visit, but also was his cousin? Mm-hmm. Uh, I have never heard this question before. It's pretty neat. Uh, yeah, it says in John one thirty one, I did not know him. This is John the Baptist speaking. I did not know him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing with water. It's important to read 32 and 33 too, so I'll, I'll do that. John bore witness saying, I have beheld the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he abided on him. And I did not know him, so he says it again. I did not know him, but he who sent me back to baptize with water said to me, the one upon whom you see the spirit descending and abiding on him, this is the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit. So um, when John says he didn't know Christ, uh, it's, it's, it seems to be saying he didn't know him as the Messiah. He didn't know that Jesus, his cousin, was the Messiah. Um, he didn't know him in that way as the, the context talks about the Lamb of God, the anointed one, the fulfiller of the new covenant. He didn't know him that way. Uh, in Luke 141, that, the event where uh, Elizabeth comes and, uh, or Mary comes to Elizabeth and um, they're both pregnant and uh, John Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb, uh, and she's filled with the Holy Spirit in the presence of uh, Mary and uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, doesn't require John the Baptist in the womb to know who Jesus, the Messiah, is, or to know who the Messiah is. It's just we're not given much detail there about it. We're just told that that's what happened, that there was this some sort of spiritual uh, awareness. Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit is was operative in that event because Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit was doing something there to signify there was something special about the baby in Mary's womb. Uh, that's all the, I think that's talking about. Uh, and as far as John the Baptist and Jesus being uh, cousins, um, we don't know how much time they spent together. We don't know how well they knew each other. Um, we're not given any detail, actually, so we can't assume anything. I mean, he, they could have been, they could have never met. They could have hung out, you know, every weekend, or they could have, you know, gone to homeschooling together. I don't know. Maybe like a family reunion. Or yeah, I, who knows? <laughs> but uh, but either way. Uh, it's, it's, it's that John Baptist didn't know Jesus as the Messiah. And that's why in verse 33, it says that the father had to tell John the Baptist, this is how you're going to know who the Messiah is. They're going to have these signs at the baptism. And when John the Baptist saw that, he connected the dots. You know. All right. Question four. Can you explain what the Bible means when 2 Corinthians 5.21 says Jesus was made sin? Did God have to turn away from Jesus when he was on the cross because the Father is holy and Jesus was bearing our sin? Yeah, love that question. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Uh, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
So, it's saying that the Father made the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. The words to be are uh, italicized. I have the LSV. NAS, they're italicized also. That means that the Greek verb of to be is not there. It's supplied. So literally it's he made him who knew no sin, sin. Right? So it's not saying that uh, Jesus became a sinner. Right? Because if he becomes a sinner on the cross, then then he can no longer die for our sins because he's no longer the spotless lamb, right? So he doesn't become a sinner. Uh, he's treated like a sinner. And we get that because um, verse 19, it says, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. How? Not counting their transgressions against them. So, that's that's what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, how God is counting uh, or accounting our sins. Uh, when we are saved and forgiven, God is not counting our sins against us. And how is that possible? Well, he explains that later in verse 21, that he... What it's saying basically is that he counted our sins against him so that he doesn't have to count our sins against us. So that's essentially what that verse is saying in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. In the second part, um, yet did God have to turn away from Jesus when he was on the cross because the Father is holy and Jesus was bearing our sin. Yeah, so because of that accounting and because of that, uh, that judgment on the cross, that's what was happening. God the Father was accounting our sin against the Son. What's the payment for that counting? What's the payment uh, what's the, uh, for that reckoning him or seeing or, or treating him as a sinner? Uh, it's forsakenness, right? So how does God treat the sinner in hell, well, Jesus tells us in Matthew uh, 7, I believe, right? Uh, or 5, depart from me, right? I never knew you. That eternal departing, eternal removal from the goodness of God, that is hell. And uh, that's how God treats sinners in his judgment. And so that's how he treated his son because he viewed him that way. Not because he was a sinner, but because that's how he was being counted. Yeah. All right. Question number five. How should one apologetically respond to others who say Christians are not allowed to judge others' sins, such as the LGBTQ plus lifestyle? What is a good way to explain what the Bible means to unbelievers and its commands, and when it commands us not to judge. So I think here, apologetically, is like giving a defense, more so not like being apologetic about it. Right, right, right. Yeah, how do we answer that question of, I thought you guys were, I thought God is love. I thought you're not supposed to judge. I mean, you know, Jesus said, you know, do not judge so that you will not be judged, right? I, how come you're judging me? As, you know, as a sinner, as, as, you know, for because of what I'm doing. Well, this is coming from Matthew 7, 1 through 5, right? So, verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. The 11th commandment. What's that? The 11th commandment. The 11th right? commandment. Nice. <laughs> Thou shalt not judge. But it's interesting. That's, you can think of that as almost like a proverb, right? That Jesus gives. Uh, the rest of the passage, Jesus explains or unpacks that proverb. So verse 2, for with, one, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you measure, you, it will be measured to you. So that's one reason why you do not judge. Because you will be judged by, you know, if you're going to be judged, if you're going to judge other people without mercy, then you will be judged without mercy is basically what he's saying. 
Uh, and then verse 3, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your eye? So there's another reason why you do not judge so that you will not be judged, because you are not without fault. And the, the key word there is brothers, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, because he says, uh, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye? Right. So within the household of God, we are to be judging and evaluating each other. Uh, but uh, he says, don't do this wrongly because you have to remember that you have faults as well, that you have a log in your own eye. Uh, and then verse four, uh, or can so, so there's with with that there's the humble posture behind it, right? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. he says, or do you, or how can you say that you're to your brother? Let me take the speck out of your own eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. So he just just doubles down on that. Like, look, you you're worried about the little speck in your brother's eye, but you got a log sticking out of your you got a two by four sticking out of your head. Uh, and he, so, verse five is really where he boils it down, and he gets to. Uh, uh, what do we do with this? He says, you hypocrite, right? So that's who he's speaking against. He's speaking against hypocrisy. He's not speaking against don't ever point out when somebody sins. He's, he's speaking against hypocritical judgmentalism. Uh, and that's where he lands in verse 5. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So he doesn't say, you hypocrite, stop judging everybody. He says, you hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye. So he's basically saying, stop being hypocritical, admit, be humble that you're a sinner too. And you're probably a worse sinner than that other person. And once you get there, once you approach this whole thing humbly, uh, then you can, you're in the right state to go to your brother and deal with their sin. So he doesn't say never deal with your brother's sin. He says do it after first being humbled by your own sin and aware of your own fallenness uh, that you go to uh, others and point out their sin. Uh, so yeah, this is specifically about within the, within the church, within, our, within the brotherhood of Christianity. Uh, but the principle still holds uh, sway outside of the church. I mean, after all, we're, we're supposed to go to lost sinners uh, and tell them of their sin so that they can know that there is a Savior. So if we don't tell them of their sin, how do I, how do I, how can I tell them to repent if they don't know what to repent of? How can I tell them to be saved if they don't know what they're being saved from, which is the wrath of God against their sin and the judgment of God in eternal hell. Yeah, and just because you express disagreement doesn't mean you hate the person. Yeah. Sometimes we're on that extreme fence. Oh, they don't agree with me. You hate me. Or you don't love me because you right. don't agree with me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that That is a... That posture of the lost one who will say don't judge me lest you be judged you know you, you, you Christians aren't supposed to be judging um, yeah that it comes from an attitude of pride where they just don't want to be called out for their sin yeah, defense yeah it's a defense mechanism where they're they know that this verse is in there and they don't and they know that most Christians kind of don't really have an answer for that uh, and so you know our answer, you're apologetically going back to the question, maybe is if somebody throws that back at you, uh, you can you can tell them, well, you know, just give them an illustration of if if you have cancer and your doctor knows it, uh, and uh, the process to deal with that cancer will be painful, wouldn't it be the best thing for your doctor to tell you uh, that you're going to die from that cancer? Uh, you know, so this is the same thing, but even more importantly, this is your soul that's at stake here. And so uh, this is an act of love for me to tell you that, that you're a sinner. And so am I, you know, and it's important, to, it's important to let your speech be seasoned with grace, that you're coming to them humbly uh, and uh, with pity and compassion. 
uh, that you don't come, you're not speaking down to them, but you're taking the posture of one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Yeah, and sometimes our responses and how we come to them can mm-hmm. tear some of those walls down that are automatically up, just because they have the guard up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, question number six. Can, we're going to shift gears completely here. Can you give a description of the premillennial and amillennial positions, also the difference, and where you land on the topic of the end times? Wow. All right. <laughs> so this is probably the longer one of, of these questions. Uh, so millennial uh, comes from the word millennium. Uh, and millennium is a thousand years, right? Uh, and this is coming from Revelation 20, verses 1 through 7, where it describes their, this millennial kingdom, this thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. And so there in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 7, it's this thousand-year period. It, it says there literally a thousand years. Uh, it's a period of time in which God will fulfill his promise to establish his kingdom uh, here on earth. Where It's a time where Satan is bound, it says there. It's a time where the saints will reign with Jesus for that amount of time, uh, for that duration. So that's Revelation 20, 1 through 7. There's three views. Uh, the, the question asks for premillennial and amillennial. I'll give posts as a bonus. So, amillennial, uh, it's not the best name for that view, because, but, but amillennialism, the amillennial view, it, you can hear ah and then millennial, so no millennium, um, it's, it basically is saying that there is n- no actual thousand year period that's being talked about, uh, and this view uh, is essentially based on, uh, partly, on, on reading Revelation a certain way. The amillennial view reads Revelation, the book of Revelation, not in a chronological order, right? So when it says in uh, Revelation 19 that Christ returns and, you know, uh, comes for his bride and everything in Revelation 19, all the glory that's there. It doesn't require Revelation 20, which is after it, to be describing what happens next. Uh, It it just is saying Revelation 20 is just going back and describing, you know, Revelation 5 through 19, essentially, in in some respects. So it it has a reading of Revelation that's not chronologically in order. It basically says that, you know, Revelation describes the end times from all these different perspectives, uh, all these different angles and views over and over and over again. Um, Also, amillennialism uh, generally makes those physical and national promises that were made to Israel in the Old Testament, it takes those and it makes those spiritual promises that are fulfilled spiritually now in the church age. So So those physical and what seems physical and natural, uh, national promises to Israel are spiritualized, and they're ours in Christ now as the church, the bride of Christ. And so there's no uh, thousand years. We are in the millennium, they would say. And we've been grafted in. We've been grafted in, and even, in, yeah, 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 we've been grafted in. Um, Post millennial view. The post millennial view. Uh, teaches also, it also teaches that the millennial kingdom is happening now, but it doesn't spiritualize it. It makes it actual and real, like physical. So the post-millennial view uh, says that the promises of Revelation 20 are actually being fulfilled today in the church age in the world, not just spiritual things but socially and governmentally and physically in this world. So, there, so essentially to the post-millennial view, things are 
progressively, though not perfectly in a straight line, but progressively improving and getting better. And it's seeking this time, this point where uh, the world is more or less Christianized, where the kingdom of Christ uh, reigns predominantly in this world. That's post-millennial. Um, and at that point, that is when Christ will return. That's why they have the name post-millennial, because after this period, uh, it may not be a thousand years exactly, but after this period of Christianizing the world and improvement, post that, that's when Christ comes. Uh, I don't hold to that. Uh, I hold to premillennial. So that's the, the last one. Premillennial view teaches that Christ will return to this earth after the tribulation, uh, but before the thousand year kingdom. So uh, the premillennial view holds to a chronological view of Revelation that as you read it, that's how it will unfold in history. And uh, it teaches that society will, instead of continually getting better generally, it will continually getting worse generally because of the decay of sin. That's by the way, is the same as amillennialism. Amillennials believe the same thing there. Uh, but it teaches that the physical and national fulfillment of God's promises to Israel will happen for Israel. And that's what will happen in the millennial kingdom, that those physical national promises will be physically and nationally fulfilled for Israel, God's people. I hold to the premillennial view. Um, that's, that's that. Uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's a lot of detail within all of those things. And even within amillennialism, Postmillennialism, premillennialism, there are divisions and nuances where, you know, there, there's, you know, yeah, there's nuances within those things. There are things in all of those views that I agree with and amen, uh, but as a whole package, I, I can't adopt them. Okay, let me repeat what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. But yeah, that's a lot. Lot. We have to a follow-up question in the back. Should we? Oh yes. That? From the ball guy in the back. Go ahead. <laughs> now we're getting the mixtures. Oh yeah, I, I won't get into. <laughs> I won't get into that then. Uh, just there, like I said, there are different nuances uh, to um, premillennialism. Uh, I am not hard and fast dispensational, though. I'll just say that. I believe that there is continuity and difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, between Israel and the church. There's continuity and difference. Yeah. Okay. All right. Question seven. What are your thoughts about moving somewhere that had a really good church to pursue a relationship and move back to the church I left with my spouse? So I'm assuming this person got married in between that time and then came back? <laughs> Sounds like it, or yeah, baits the person at the other church. Yeah, the fishes and then catches. Hey, hey, girl, back. if you want to yeah. get with me, <laughs> got to go to RBC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Man, I need to do some teaching on dating. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, but. Uh, I would say that, just generally speaking, God usually doesn't bless uh, when we seek our own desires, unless our desires are him. Uh, so you see in Genesis 13, where um, Abraham and Lot, right, they leave the land of Ur. And they go and they're traveling and they're rich and they're, and they're prosperous. Abraham and Lot's uh, property and people, they, they are, begin to become too large for them to stay in one land to pull on the same resources. There's just too many of them. They have to split up into different areas for the sake of you know, resources and things like that. 
And so Abraham defers there in Genesis 13. He defers to Lot and he says, pick whatever place you want, right? You can have this, this, this. He lays out all the land before, before him. And he says, have your pick. I'll just, I'll take whatever you don't pick. And so it says there in Genesis 13 that Lot saw this certain land, the land of the Chaldeans, I believe. Uh, it was basically the land where Sodom and Gomorrah was. Uh, and we find that out later in the passage. But he's, it says that he saw, saw it, that it was lush and that it was green and fruitful. And, and because of that, he chose that area. And it's, then it goes on to say, well, Abraham just essentially... Uh, went where God told him to go. And we know, hopefully we know, how those two stories ended up, right? Where Lot was given over to compromise and he was, um, he, had, he didn't have spiritual backbone, um, you know, uh, and Abraham followed the Lord and God blessed him. Uh, and so, for, for this question, if, if, if somebody goes to another church because it's green and fruitful with, uh, with young ladies, right, that the land is plentiful with, with women, and he goes there because of that, that sounds more like Lot than Abraham to me. And so I would just say, I'm not saying it's a sin, I'm saying that I would not be surprised if you find that God is not giving you what you're seeking. That you have that part of your lesson that God is going to have to teach you when you do that is he's going to make you wait even longer to get married and to find to find a spouse. I've seen it um, time and time again where somebody idolizes companionship, marriage, and all that, so all the good things, they idolize it, though. And God withholds that good thing from them because they want it more than they want him. And uh, Christ says himself uh, in Matthew 6, right? Uh, Seek first his kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be added. So choosing a church based on how many uh, potential spouses there are, doesn't sound like seeking his kingdom and his righteousness first. It sounds like seeking your desires and your kingdom first. And uh, we'll just figure out this, the Jesus stuff along the way. That's really what it sounds like. So I would say I wouldn't be, don't be surprised if God doesn't bless that and, and even if he makes it more difficult for you in the long run. But, You know, there are small churches that don't have a lot of single gals or a lot of single guys. Uh, if, if you just be a Christian and be a Christian in the Christian community, uh, meaning, you know, uh, I mean, even in the New Testament, you have this, this, it seems like a lot of local churches had good, meaningful relationships with each other. And uh, so we should expect that today. Uh, and so if we are fulfilling that and having good, meaningful relationships with other churches, then that interaction, that cross-training, that fishing in other ponds, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's going to happen over time, but it's gonna, it should happen in the right context of conferences and, 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 and special events and things like that. That will happen over time. Uh, but you need to be seeking first his kingdom and righteousness. And God will always provide uh, you the desires of your heart if you're seeking him first. If you're not seeking him first, he will withhold. Yeah. All right. Question eight. Is holiness achievable on this side of glory with God's help? Uh, yes. Next question. No. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's not only achievable, it's, it's commanded, it's expected. Holiness is. Uh, it's the expected norm of the Christian life. For, uh, 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, uh, where we are described as holy uh, in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11, 
we are, it says, but you were washed, you were sanctified. That is the, another translation of the word made holy. That's what it means. It, it, same, it shares the same Greek word. And so, yes, we are holy. We are, to, we are commanded to be holy for he is holy. And we have the expectation that we will be perfectly holy uh, in the age to come. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. That's going to happen completely and perfectly then. And does that, that's, that does not mean that we are not sinless. Because you can replace, sometimes maybe we get the word holiness confused with sinless. Mm, and somebody good. here that's can mean, yeah. is, is sinlessness achievable on the other side of the glory mm. with Christ, or with God's help? Yeah. And then we may have some heresy issues and different things like that. Yeah, yeah. We cannot achieve sinlessness in this life. So if holy, if you, if by, that's good. Uh, if, if by holiness you mean perfect, like perfectly holy, like saintly or whatever, uh, which is a wrong understanding of the word, uh, then no, we will not be perfectly without sin in this life. But that doesn't mean we're not set apart. Right, or it doesn't mean that we're not different from the world, that we're not other, right? Even with our sins, with our shortcomings, with our failings, we can still live lives that are very other than the world. Yeah. And holy is set apart, like at its That's fundamental That's what holiness meaning. means. Yeah. yeah, it means set apart, distinct, uh, other, separated. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what it means. All right. Next question. I have a really good friend who professes to be a believer, but sometimes their actions don't show their fruit. I confronted them about it, but they said, I have my own convictions. What should I do? Uh, I would say the first thing that you need to do is make sure that you're, that you're actually talking about sin or convictions. You've got to really clarify that. Um, Make sure that what you think is a law of God, like thou shalt not, you got to make sure that what you think is a law is not in actuality a, sin, uh, a conviction, right? So you have to be, in order to do that, you have to be able to point to Scripture and say, thus saith the Lord. You know, it's, it's, it's crystal clear that you cannot do this, that God forbids what you're doing, um, now, if you've already talked to your friend, uh, the best thing that you can do next is pray for them. So if it's a conviction, just pray for them and love them, you know. Um, but if it's really, if you really believe it's an actual sin, then that person uh, is an unrepentant sin. And Matthew 18 tells us what to do to bring somebody along with us so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Matthew 18. It would be good for you to find someone that is wiser than you, uh, godlier than you, just to help double check you uh, and make sure that this is actually a sin and you're just not overreacting uh, to a conviction. Um, yeah, again, if it's not sin... Then Romans 14, 3, we talked about this in our uh, ethics uh, series that we're going to be starting back up. Uh, Romans 14, 13, you must not judge. Uh, Galatians 5, 14, you must truly love that friend, even if they have a very different conviction than you do. You have to not judge, you guard your heart from judgmentalism. And, I mean, we'll go back to kind of the, one of the first earlier questions, right? Take the log out of your own eye. Make sure that you're approaching that person humbly uh, and having a, a, an attitude of humility, not hypocrisy. I think, too, let me rephrase the question, too, a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, so we all have people in our lives who profess to be believers, but mm -hmm. the long term of their life mm -hmm. doesn't show fruit that we would expect yeah. uh, from a believer, right? They're not growing in sanctification. They're not growing in the knowledge of God. They're not seeking the things of God. They don't enjoy being with his people. They don't enjoy his word, but the overall progression of their life 
doesn't show that they what they said in their confession of faith is true. Yeah. And maybe that's the angle this question is coming at. Yeah. Because if they say, yeah, it doesn't show their fruit, it maybe it's more longer fruit. term sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe that, well, it's my conviction, is just kind of another defense mechanism uh, of just don't bother me <laughs> about my you sin. You should don't judge, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't judge. judge. It's yeah. just a different version of that. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, if we're talking about patterns, then look for, I would say, look for those patterns. Look for repeated uh, unfruitfulness of repentance. Look for the l- patterns of of disobedience to certain commands. That's usually what it, where it shows up the most. Uh, I mean, you don't go to church like you're. You know, you say you're a Christian. Like that's it says, do not forsake the assembly or stuff like that. And it could uh, be in immaturity issues too. I mean, they yeah. could be a believer, but they're just not growing in sanctification. Mm-hmm as quickly as we might think, or right. it's just be a mature believer for a long period of time, right? Uh, yeah, and Jesus says a tree will be known by its fruit, right? And so, um, yeah, uh, MacArthur has said time and truth go hand in hand, right? Uh, the truth will be known uh, as time goes on. So you just have to let time go by, and if you have let time go by and there's no fruitfulness, then it's your brotherly, sisterly duty to uh, exhort and encourage a professing believer. Show them, you know, a tree is known by its fruit. Uh, show them, uh, you know, ask them, you know, are you bearing fruit? Uh, but but kind of what, what you mentioned, uh, I, I think God wisely, Jesus wisely uses the analogy of fruit. Right, a tree will be known by its fruit, and even the fruit of the spirit. Uh, because if you've ever had a, a fruit-bearing tree, you know that, uh, like we have a persimmon tree in our backyard. Uh, we already have some persimmons that are ready to be plucked, and it's not even that season. Uh, and uh, there will be a there will be a time this year, later this year, when those persimmons are all they're ready. But then even late into next year, there's going to be some persimmons that are just holding out and just like there's hardly any other leaves left on the tree. But finally, that, you know, those last few persimmon fruit, uh, they ripen. Mm-hmm. Right. So fruit, some fruit uh, ripens or grows at different paces than others. And so we have to allow for God in his timing to bear that fruit out. Uh, all the while encouraging that person to do whatever we can to help promote fruit bearing uh, within the kingdom of God. All right, last question. Biblically speaking, does Steve Lawson's actions disqualify him from ever preaching slash pastoring ever again? Yeah, this is important, I think. First Timothy, First Timothy 3, right? Uh, it is a trustworthy saying, if any man aspires to the office of overseer or elder or pastor, uh, he desires a good work. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. And then it goes on. So, uh, what's too common in the evangelical church today is a pastor or elder, or overseer uh, is in office and fails morally. And, you know, they feel real bad. They get caught. They feel real bad. A few months go by, you know, they're still going to church. You know, they're still seeing them. They're repentant, and they really want to get back into ministry. They really want to start preaching again because they're so good at it. Uh, and the church says, okay, come on back because we really miss your preaching. You know, and, and we're supposed to be loving anyways, right? We're supposed to be forgiving. And so they let that pastor back in to that role quickly. I would say far too quickly. That is way too common in the evangelical church today. Um, it, it doesn't give... Uh, it, it doesn't fulfill really um, the overarching qualification 
That's in verse 2 of above reproach, right? Uh, that man is not, uh, he has to, this, this idea of above reproach is, is that elders must not give anyone a reason to attack his reputation, God's reputation, or the reputation of the church. That's why he has to be above reproach, because it's not just his reputation on the line. It's the reputation of Christ, it's the reputation of the church that's on the line. Specifically when it comes to Steve Lawson, uh, to me it seems what seems like the length, we don't know all the details, but some things have gotten out, right? So what the seeming length of what of that relationship, that inappropriate relationship, the depth of sin that seems to have been there uh, has, to me, displayed this major inability to judge rightly. Um, so how can he have that office that requires that wisdom if he has displayed that, that a severe lack of wisdom in his own life? especially for so long. Uh, and also the prominence of Steve Lawson, the prominence of, of this man um, makes it much more difficult for him to regain that reputation, yeah, that's especially like the, with the world. Yeah, that's like the being thought of well by outsiders too, right? Yes, that part plays being into thought that, of well by which outsiders. Which is a requirement. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And so because of his breadth, there is a higher responsibility and damage is greater and to put those pieces back together uh, I, I think it's just too much it's, and it would take too long where he cannot uh, fulfill an office of pastor where he, he should not fill a pulpit again for the rest of his life because of his age because of the because of all those things uh, he just doesn't have the time left in his life to do that it doesn't seem um, that being said, uh, it's my understanding, and I'm not alone on this, uh, Piper takes this view. Uh, um, oh, uh, what's his name? Wells, I think. Is, oh, I forget his name. Uh, the, the pastor of pastoral, uh, the professor of pastoral ministry at uh, Southern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary. Um, both uh, say that there might be circumstances where a man has committed some real moral, moral failure in his past, but has truly repented, truly shown fruit that re of that repentance for a long time. I'm talking years. And it might be possible that this man has slowly regained a solid and trusted reputation of being a one-woman man, because that's the qualification, a one-woman man, right? So for those that say if you do it ever, then you're always disqualified for the rest of your life, uh, you know, that's not the qualification, though. Uh, the qualification is you have the reputation of a one-woman man. Uh, adultery mars that and it will take a lot of work a lot of time to regain that reputation again but it can't happen because god is powerful and gracious and forgiving um i would say it would take years in some cases it would take decades uh and the assumption is that the i would say the assumption should be that that man should just go find like Piper said you should, that man should just go find a good job and attend a good church and just love his wife and ride off into the sunset that would be the norm um, but it is possible for some uh, given special circumstances to uh, you know to be restored to the point of, of quali being qualified for that because uh, we have to hold in, we have to hold both as true the protection of the flock right 
the honor of the gospel. We can't compromise that. We have to hold that, and we have to hold on to the greatness of God's compassion, patience, and forgiveness. Both are real. Both are true. And we have to make those coexist in these, in these circumstances. So, yeah. A clarifying question in the audience? <laughs> Sure. Do we have time? Uh, yeah, we got. I guess we got time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We're a little bit over. Okay, we're a little bit over. Uh, I'll go as quick as I can. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what about this man's books, literature that he's written, uh, and and can God use him at all in the church? And I, I say that because it's important because some people, when they see somebody who's failed, they don't want to be a part of that church anymore, <laughs> right? They think because he's failed, he's fallen so great that um, he's no longer qualified to even. Uh, I would say that wiser men than me uh, would say, uh, when it comes to his materials, I would never suggest another Lawson book to another person again. But I may read his books privately. I would say that. Uh, and then as far as how can... And can God use him at all? Absolutely. Just not in, as, not just not as a pastor and, uh, you know, biblically qualified elder, which is the kind of person who should be filling the pulpit, right? We should only have qualified men filling the pulpit. So he can do any other ministry that's not in the pulpit, right? And it may take time. He needs to focus on his marriage, his wife, all you know, his repentance, but he can do, you know, some uh, Bible study or some ministry uh, with older people, with retired people or something like that. But just not in that role. Um, but I would, I would say even then, that would, it shouldn't happen right away. Yeah. Okay. Good. I think that's it. All right. Uh, All right. Yeah, Closing prayer. Yeah. Well, let l- let me read to you uh, Colossians one, if I may, bro. Uh, Colossians one nine to ten. For this reason, also, since the day we heard, have not ceased to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the full knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom, and understanding. So that's what we're trying to do tonight, right? Be filled with wisdom, knowledge, understanding. But then verse ten, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So I encourage you, you know, some of the stuff that we talked about is maybe heady, maybe just some deeper doctrinal issues. But uh, the, the reason why we have nights like this, the reason why we do dive deeply to plumb the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God is so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So I trust that as a result of tonight, you would leave here differently, that you would act differently, that you would live differently tonight and tomorrow, even as a result of some of what you heard tonight. Yeah. Can I pray? All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your wisdom. You tell us, uh, Lord, in James, if any man lacks wisdom, Let him ask God. And so, Lord, we ask you, give us wisdom because we all lack it. We all lack wisdom. 
And so we must ask you day to day uh, to fill our minds with your truth, to apply your truth to our lives with skill. Lord, help us uh, to be students of your word, whether we are uh, 10 years old or 80 years old. Lord, we are always to be learning, always to be studious learners and uh, students of, of your scriptures, Lord. So may we never give that up, that pursuit of growing in our understanding and knowledge. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, we would not be merely hearers of your word, but doers also. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. You're